I'm Eddie Wu and welcome to Education Live. I've been speaking with people from all walks of life about how mathematics is connected to their life and their work. And this morning I have the great joy of being joined by my friend and food extraordinaire, Alice Sasavsky. Alice, thanks for joining us. Eddie Wu, good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> now, Alice, it's really important before we get stuck into things to start off by recognizing, like right now, um, you're speaking to us from Melbourne and uh, we have um, so many thoughts going to you and the entire community there, indeed across um, Victoria. It's like an incredibly tough time. So ex extra special thanks, I guess, for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. We are the canaries down the coal mine. So just, you know, <laughs> Learn some lessons and don't do, don't do the things. <laughs> we are doing our best. Now, Alice, usually I start off by giving our viewers like a bit of an introduction to our guest, uh, but it's actually a really incredibly difficult task to introduce you because you wear so many different hats and you've done so many different things throughout your life. Like you're, you're an author, podcaster, uh, TV host, creator in general. Um, one of the most recent things I've enjoyed watching you in is your role as culinary correspondent for the ABC. So because you've got so many different feathers in your hat, um, I'd love to start with something that you and I share in common, which is that you began your professional life as a teacher. Um, did. Alice, what did, you, what did you teach? Well, I was the, uh, like you, I was the head of my department. So I was the head of the humanities department, so history, geography for middle school. So I was teaching all the way from grade five to year eight, which I'm sure some of the viewers are in right now. And I was an English teacher as well. So a year eight homeroom teacher. And I still, you know, it's funny because that was sort of in the um, 2010s. Um, <laughs> and, um, Let's not date it too closely, shall not, we? Else? Yeah, exactly. But um, my students are now in their 20s and they, you know, reach out to me on socials and they're just like, they still call me Miss Z, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> that is very, very cool. Now, you said 2010s before. Um, one of the things which has helped you become sort of uh, across the public awareness, certainly is the first place I uh, encountered you, was in 2012, I think it was. Yep. You went on MasterChef. Now, I know from you mentioned your sort of humanities um, area. People might think, oh, you're a teacher, not like a food technology teacher. Um, I should point out, you didn't just go on MasterChef. You got into the final four of your season. So I guess I would love to know, um, why did you enter? Like, what were you aiming to achieve? Well, I certainly wasn't aiming to leave, you know, just before finals week, but it was kind of, um, it was funny. So when, um, I, before I went on MasterChef, I was always trying to encourage my kids to find opportunities to weave food into what we were learning. And that's because I not only found that they um, enjoyed it because they were engaged more, but I also found that um, the, the knowledge and food literacy was lacking. So that was kind of my hook, but also my opportunity to give them some life skills that they would be able to walk away with forever. Um, and the place where I was doing a lot of my own learning was also the place where the MasterChef auditions were taking uh, place. And so I ended up auditioning <laughs> because I thought that if my kids see me on the show for like an episode or two, then they will um, maybe want to learn more about food with me. So that was um, as, as technical really as it, as it got or um, as forward thinking as it got. But then I did a lot better than I expected. So, you know, doors started opening and I thought, well, I'm here now, so what can I do? And I wrote on a piece of paper, teacher but bigger. And everything that I've done from that point was always you know, with the eye of a teacher and the skills of a teacher, because the skills are very transferable, but also in a way that kids and grown-ups listen to mm, more. <laughs> that's incredible. No, I love yeah. that. And it's brilliant that, you know, having also been on TV, but still wearing that teacher hat, I think it's mm. funny that like you, it's about a love for helping people learn that I think 100%. is amazing. And of course, a lot of people on MasterChef, everyone's got their different reasons for getting on the show. And I'm sure some people, like their goal is to start a restaurant. But I just love that all the way through that, your heart was about, well, what's going to give me a bit of street cred with my students if I, you know, get... To... And you were incredibly successful and Australia really did fall in love with you from that point on, even more so than before. Now, food, right, is something which, it's really interesting to me that you mentioned, like you said, the, the literacy, like understanding of uh, nutrition and how important that is, is something which is, is pretty low across Australian culture. Like I remember growing up and thinking about like your, your plate of food and having the different uh, quantities of different food groups and kind of, I thought, all right, that's, it's in my brain. But if you asked me about that after that lesson was finished, I was like, mm, I know I'm meant to have lots of veggies and that's kind of all I remembered. So I definitely lacking in a lot of areas and I realized, okay, 
um, I've got a lot to grow here, right? Now, my mum, she loved cooking and one of the last gifts she gave me and my siblings before she um, passed away a long time ago uh, was a book of family recipes that we had all grown up enjoying. So food's got a really sentimental place in my heart as I think it does for many. But um, cooking isn't just emotional, uh, it's also mathematical. Like because you are a great cook, I understand you're, you have to be across a bunch of numbers and measurements. Could, could you help us understand how does that matter when you're preparing a dish? Yeah, well, it's funny you mentioned, you know, food literacy. I think nutrition is a very small part, actually, of the way that we should understand food. There's so much more to it. There's the context, there's the culture, there's the geography and the history. There's also the language of food there. And there are the numbers of food and, you know, the science of food. So I think it's funny. At school, maths was certainly not one of my favourite subjects. I did it because I had to all the way through to year 12 um, because I wanted to get into a certain course. But because I was doing it begrudgingly, I actually mm. ended up doing worse than I needed to get into the course. Eddie Wu, oh, can you imagine? No, I know. I know, but you know, it's funny because the course that I would have done had like a shiitake load of statistics and numbers <laughs> as well. So yeah. I feel like maybe the universe was saying, listen, You'll get there. And it's the course was marketing management psychology. So what I do now, if you think about it, is I'm marketing vegetables to the world. I'm managing myself and my own business. And I'm also using a lot of um, psychology and principles of psychology and psychoanalysis and, and you know, behavior, consumer behavior insights to do what I do. So that's kind of a good lesson in life, right? You, you will get where you want to go. It might just not take the direction that you want it to. But uh, what I also didn't realize is how much I would end up using maths in what I do now. But I think that um, I have an innate sense for maths. Um, and that's because, stand by, my... <laughs> Tell you what, tech. We would this would not be happening if we were doing this in one room. But uh, oh, of course, it's no, cool. I'm so I like it. You know, video. <laughs> it's very cool. Um, my parents are both academics. They're both professors, and um, my mum actually has a mathematics degree. So, wow. you know, and we should think, point out um, as well for the viewers, even though uh, you have your beautiful Australian accent, you were born in Georgia, and from like former USSR, it's kind of mm. like yes, you know, you you must have the mathematics. This is something which is is non negotiable, right? Like that whole micro totally. background is a real thing, right? Absolutely. And I was at Russian school every Sunday. So we had like extra maths there. Um, in fact, two lessons. So there was like the maths theory, but also maths history. So looking at the wow. different mathematicians, it was wild. Anyway. That's epic. But all of that, it is epic, but it's informed what I do now. And again, it's kind of, it becomes muscle memory, like riding a bike, right? So when I'm, um, you know, the maths of food. So where do I begin? I mean, there's measurement. So something as simple as looking at a recipe, especially for baking, it's really important to be precise. So using measuring tools, whether it be like a measuring jug, which is, um, you know, understanding that one cup is 250 mil and then understanding that it's also eight ounces or, you know, it's different um, cup measurements, you know, the proportion. So of, you've so got to be doing like all of these conversions and ratios all the time, right? All the time. And one thing that I really love about um, measurement or volume in particular is that one cup of water weighs the same. So weighs 250 mil and it's one cup always. So that's, I think that's just a really cool geeky that's fact. Right. And but it's then, cool that like there's that, um, there's volume and then there's mass and then there's like it's all fitting together just like you were saying food is connected to all these different key learning areas and all the rest exactly and i want the kids to know that like you probably know more than grown-ups because we do forget this stuff and i remember a few months ago i did a recipe for news breakfast where i had cup measures and volume measures as well and i had an email no two emails from grown-ups saying that i gave incorrect measures because um <laughs> the cup was 250 grams but then the cup of flour was 150 grams and how can that be and it's just <laughs> It's like, it's yeah, fine. us grown-ups, we actually, you're right, we sort of regress a little bit when we stop using those skills, but it's great. Like, I mean, I suppose when you're picking up a, a recipe, for example, like most of the things, especially when baking, um, I do not have the skill yet to sort of improvise my way into a cake or some muffins or something like that. But mm. that, that recipe is not going to be measured precisely for me. It's for what someone wanted to prepare. And it's like, oh, but I want more or less of that. So you've got to do all of that number crunching, yeah? Exactly. And let's say you've got um, people coming around for dinner. So you've got four people coming around for dinner. You've got four courses. You've got certain amount of plates on the table. You've got a certain amount of ingredients that you need to buy. That's uh, an algebraic equation where you're solving for X, which is like your shopping list. 
<laughs> That's brilliant. Yes, I, yeah. I've been in that exact problem so many times where I'm kind of like, oh, or in fact, just on the weekend, I had my sister over and her family, and there's four of them. There's five people in my family. Sometimes we might be joined by others. And then it's kind of like, wait, wait a second. Like, I'm going through the aisles, and I'm looking at these bags of different things, and I'm like, how do I make sure? Like, it's the ultimate shame to have not prepared enough food for everyone. Mm -hmm. But then I don't want to be eating leftovers of the same old meal that I've cooked for the next 15 days. So mm -hmm. can, you, can you actually walk me through that a little bit? Like, I don't cook meals that are super complex. Like you were talking about courses before. Can you talk me through like some of the practicalities? If you were throwing a party, right? Um, how do you make sure, what's the thought process in your mind of trying to balance out all those different things? And like you said, sort of solve that problem and thread that needle. Mm. Well, you kind of think about um, who you have there. So kids might be a half portion to grown ups. So let's say you've got two kids and that's one grown up portion. And then you would think about, um, let's say, for protein, like meat, fish, um, tofu, you would do like a palm-sized amount would be enough for grown-ups. So half a palm size for kids and a quarter palm size for toddlers, that sort of thing. So it's still very, um, still very physical and concrete for me. But for chefs, they get to a point where they think about it in gram weight. So it might be a 220 gram weight of fish. So um, on MasterChef where we had group challenges where we were cooking a lot of food, we had to make sure that we had enough food for 500 people, let's say. So we would work our way backwards. So this is how much we have. And then would we use bod mass? Is that what we're doing? Yeah, sure, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, so we'd say, okay, so that's how many eggs we have for our omelets. And then divide that by the 500 people that are coming to the Shangri-La for their buffet wow. breakfast. Yeah, how many yeah. of those people will want poached eggs? We, we're doing a lot of guesstimating as well, right? So, um, and as you say, I think the biggest problem that a cook can have is not cooking enough. So I'm always cooking extra. And I think the skill comes when you start to think about what you can do with the leftovers. And I love leftovers. <laughs> I make extra on purpose because I love doing different <laughs> stuff with the leftovers the next day. So I don't know what that is. Is that carrying the one? Mm, <laughs> anyway? Yeah, it's like well, all of these, uh, I'm thinking about like the addition or multiplication of flavors. It's a whole different idea there. And I think about like, you've just sort of made my brain sort of uh, realize that um, obviously cooking in my own home is one thing. And yeah, there's, you've mentioned uh, ratios, measurements, um, you know, all these proportions and that kind of thing. But I've always found it amazing that if, if say for example, someone ran, ran a restaurant and they kind of, I, I can pick out anything on the menu pretty much and they can say, yeah, that's right. We, I guess they had to do some kind of prediction about, you know, patterns of how many people they're going to get who ordered this or that or the rest, right? Totally. And what uh, you don't know about restaurants is that a lot of that stuff is really actually just leftovers because you're doing the prep all the, all the way through the day and then you're reheating and you're kind of assembling on the night because that's what service is all about and it's a real rush actually professional kitchen service is just like whoosh 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 because you want to do everything really fast and i guess it's kind of like maths you know the more you do it the faster you get at it so the first night of service you might be a little bit sloppy but then you get quick and it becomes like a dance really yeah yeah um, for and, sure and there is the chance that you don't make enough of something and then in the kitchen we call that 86ing so you 86 that off the menu <laughs> When you run out. Yeah, okay, all right. It's like code blue or something like that. Okay, code so. Code blue, exactly. Uh, like that right now. We're code zero. We're about <laughs> numbers like 86. Uh, I just wondered really quickly, do, do shapes or geometry figure into cooking very much? Of course they do. Think about baking where you're uh, always baking cakes in different tins and a lot of baking recipes will tell you bake this in a 22 inch tin or bake this in a 20 inch tin or whatever and if you use a different size tin then you need to think about baking time because it's going to change you know the density of your cake or, or the, the shape that it's that it's made is going to change how long it takes in the oven so a lot of bakers get to a point where they don't think about the cooking time they think about the smell so you're using all of your senses, you know, the look, so you can see the bubbling away of the cake batter in the, in the tin until it's ready to go. And obviously putting a skewer through is the traditional test. Um, but here's a tip for everyone that's watching. Don't wait till the skewer is clean because that means your cake is actually overcooked. You do oh, it'd be dry, right? Because yeah, if be it's dry. completely exactly. clean coming out, it's like it hasn't grabbed any food inside. Right. Oh, okay, all right. Exactly. This explains so, why know. my birthday cakes are never really a hit, Alice. <laughs> Eddie <laughs> Woo, 86 that. <laughs> okay, got it, got it. Uh, now, Alice, we're coming towards the end here. So I mentioned before that you're an author. Um, you've actually got a new book coming out in November, which is beautiful, In Praise of Veg. Super excited about it. Um, can you tell us what's, what's the message behind it? 
The message behind Impraise of Veg is kind of like your message behind maths. It's time for us to rethink the way that we look at vegetables because there is so much to love about vegetables. They can be delicious. It's just that they're a bit maligned and it's, it goes back to the way that they are cooked, right? So if you learn more about how to cook them in ways that bring out the caramelization, the sweetness, the flavor, the textures, then you will learn to love veg forever and not because you should eat them and not because they're you know, nutritious or, or healthful, but because they are actually the tastiest thing on the plate. And when I was a restaurant critic, I was always looking at what chefs were doing with vegetables first because that to me is the skill of the chef, what they can do with a cauliflower or, you know, how, how good can you get your caramelized Brussels sprouts, those sorts of things. And I actually really think that this generation coming through, the people watching, you have the potential to change your parents' minds about vegetables because a lot of parents grew up with overboiled cabbage and you know undercooked peas and 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 they actually don't like vegetables and they're serving them up because they think they have to but you could revolutionize the way that your family eats vegetables just by having a look at the recipes in the book and eddie you'll be very proud the book itself has like a matrix in it like a, a vegetable spreadsheet i suppose oh, and it oh alice you're talking <laughs> my language now <laughs> So if you look at it almost like a graph, I suppose, it's how much time do you have? What vegetable do you have? And then, you know, what do you feel? Oh, like that's so good. Your flavor, yeah. And so Fantastic. that's kind of for, for maths heads. Um, and I had to use spreadsheets to actually get my book done because it was, you know, over 150 recipes. Uh, we shot, you know, over 110 of the photos of, of the dish, food on plate, we call it. Uh, and the whole thing's, you know, close to 500 pages. So for someone that doesn't actually love homework and has never loved homework, I had to sit on my tuchus and just <laughs> write for months. Um, but I'm so proud of myself. You know, I think there's one thing that when you create something that's not just me, it's a big team that's come behind it as well. But when you see it, I still haven't got the hard copy of the book. So, but I just can't wait. I'm going to get it in a couple of weeks and I'm going to be holding it and you will see it. So in praise of veg uh, and when you get it and when you cook from it, please do tag me and I'd love to see it. Oh, and Alice, <laughs> I'm so excited. And like you said, I think that there's this wonderful opportunity um, that young people have today. In some ways, um, you know, in an, they have this unparalleled sort of um, door opening to them to say, hey, actually, yeah, it's not just not just because you have to, but actually the, they're brilliant. And we, um, we are missing out if we don't incorporate these beautiful foods into what we eat and share with our families and enjoy, right? 100% and I suffer from FOMO in a massive way. So that's why I love food because I'm always meeting new foods. I'm never feeling like I'm missing out because I get to taste something new. And if we cultivate that sense of FOMO with fresh food, then we will never be bored of what's on our plates. <laughs> that's perfect. All right, now Alice, final note. Um, even though you're not in school anymore, I know you have and you know you still retain such a heart for kids. Uh, I can see that especially in the brilliant food resource um, phenomenon that you sort of uh, conceived and created and that's one of the things that you and I have worked on together. One of the most fun things I ever did. Um, for the kids, do you have one last message to leave with our viewers about food or mathematics or both or life in general? Oh, that's a big, you know, that's a lot of pressure, Eddie Wu, to leave with one thing. But I think what I, what I can say is um, we're working on the next phase of phenomenon at the moment, and it's to do with food and mood. Um, obviously, we're going through a really tough time globally at the moment um, with everything that's, that's going on with the pandemic and just with all the upheaval. Um, but it's a real opportunity for us to seize this moment and to recognise that there are some things that we can't control, but there's also a lot of stuff that we can. So thinking about how much we get out into nature, thinking about how much um, we move our bodies because that you know, activates the good, feel good hormones in our brains and what we put into our bodies when it comes to food. Um, not just, you know, don't, don't look at the nutritional guidelines, taste what makes you feel good because fresh food makes me buzz. It gives me a real kind of zing and it will do the same for you. So, um, you know, that's just one element. I'm not here to sell you on veg. That is 100% not what I'm trying to do. But what I am trying to say is that you control what you can control and, and, and what will happen is that over time, just like the muscle memory of, of learning um, how to calculate numbers or learning to understand food, you'll get to a point where you can go, I'm not in the best mood right now. What can I do to shift that? Hmm. 
That is perfect, Alice. I think it is just the message we need to hear, especially at a time like this. So thank you so much again for taking the time to hang out with us in your beautiful kitchen over there. Um, take care and um, we'll be in touch with you really soon. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us to Education Live. I'm Eddie Wu. Take care, see you next time.